Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Takuin Minamoto, who is in Tokyo, I believe. Are you not? Yes, that's right. Good. And um, I found out about you because a friend of mine, uh, who is sort of a fan of these shows, watches them regularly, often sends me recommendations of people he thinks I should interview. And he said, interview this guy. He said, he's very minimalist. He got awakened at the sound of a car horn. Uh, he's, he's living in Japan. And he, uh, he acknowledges that there is a process, but he's very minimalist, whatever he meant by that. And um, mm. I glanced at your website briefly before emailing you, but I don't know a whole lot about you. And I kind of like it that way because it sort of makes the interviews interesting. And the people who are watching this don't know a lot about you either. So I'll ask questions that they might ask. All right. <laughs> so uh, you've watched some of these interviews, and you know how I, you know how I do them. And basically, it's a little you know little autobiography of a yogi sort of thing, where you describe uh, the process of your awakening, what led to it, what has transpired after it, and just generally share your perspective on things. Um, so where would you like to start? Um, well. I guess we can start uh, with that day, uh, which was December first, two thousand six. And if at any time uh, you want to go back, just you know, we can get into that. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, later, and also, um, I'm not. I, I was never really a spiritual seeker in any sort of traditional sense, and mm -hmm. I don't. I still to this day don't read those books. So, a lot of the terms you use, I might not know what you're saying. So, well, I probably won't use too many terms. <laughs> that's good. So I may I may need to ask a few questions of you if I'm not understanding you, but that's just that's my deficiency. You know, sure. it's not because you know your lack of uh, uh, explaining something. No so, problem. Um, what happened on that day? Uh, it was in Boston. It, well, it was outside of Boston in um, the town Alston, mm -hmm. and. Um, I don't really remember, I don't think anything could have really led to what had happened because it wasn't done through any doing on my part. I was crossing um, a parking lot of a popular uh, restaurant slash uh, grocery store called Super 88. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't remember if the person was coming in or coming out, but um, I walked in front of a car that was either entering or exiting. and he didn't hit me. He slammed on his brakes, laid on his horn, and at that moment, something happened that was so uh, emptying or so completely... Uh, well, it was completely beyond the word as I had known it before that point. And uh, like I said at the beginning, I'd never really been a searcher. I had read a few books here and there, but I think the idea of enlightenment or liberation or whatever people call it, I think it never really entered my consciousness so much. I just thought, you know, oh, that might be the Dalai Lama or that might be this person or that person, but it doesn't apply to me. I'm just this guy, you know. I never really had any thoughts about it one way or the other. So... Um, you mentioned uh, about a process. There may indeed have been a process, but I think when you're in the process, you have no real awareness of it in that sense. You can't look at it and say, well, I'm at this particular stage or I'm at a particular level. I think it's easy on the outside for someone to analyze it and say, oh, this must be this stage or that stage. But uh, for me to have done that, there may have been a process, but I didn't have anything to do with it. Huh. I didn't. I, I don't think I really even noticed if there was one happening or not. So, what did you actually experience when the guy slammed on his brakes and blew his horn? I mean, was it, uh, you know, an adrenaline rush because you almost got hit, or was there something much different than that uh, that uh, predominated in your experience? Not adrenaline. It was almost as if there was an emptying of something, uh -huh. almost as if a spectral car had come through and hit the body and the spectral essence was 
killed, but the organism lived on. I don't know if that makes any sense. I'm not sure what you mean by a spectral car. Well, it was almost as if the body the body survived the encounter. Sure, he didn't even the, get hit, right? Yeah, but the the person didn't huh. survive. It's almost, and I don't know. So people talk about ego death or, you know, the ego disappearing and so on when they have a spiritual awakening. So are you suggesting that the shock of that incident somehow triggered a, what we might call an ego death. Well, I don't know if that's... It happened at that moment, but I can't look back and say why, or it happened because of this or because of that. Right. But for, what, for, for whatever reason, um, it may have been coupled with what I was thinking about at the time, which I can't remember. I, I really doubt, but... Uh, Whatever happened at that moment when he slammed on the horn, maybe there was some shock, you know, of almost being hit by the car, mm -hmm. and a combination of uh, uh, what might have been going on in my head at the time might have led to that, but I really have no way of knowing. Yeah, I think it's hard to assign causality. <laughs> um, and, uh, well, so at that very moment then what there's a book i read which this kind of reminds me of uh called collision of the in collision with the infinite by a woman named suzanne mm. siegel and she had had a meditation background um you know had become a tm teacher and everything and but had then drifted away from it and hadn't been meditating for a few years and was living in Paris and married and pregnant and she had just been to a swimming pool and, and she was coming home and getting on the bus and just as she stepped on the bus all of a sudden there was this sudden awakening and uh, a, an abrupt loss of personal identity of ego structure and so on and uh, it terrified her and she didn't know what had happened to her and she spent the next 10 years trying to you know, in a state of terror while, meanwhile, living a normal life, raising a daughter, getting a Ph.D., and so on, but going to therapists and all kinds of people trying to figure out what was wrong because she felt like there was no her, and there was no self, there was no person. And uh, finally, she met a spiritual teacher, Jean Klein, who managed to kind of point out to her that this had been a spiritual awakening, and she kind of relaxed into it and began to enjoy it and live, and live with it and realize. So for you, was there any sort of crisis like oh my god what happened to me I, uh, <laughs> you know, where am I well no um, the only way I can explain it is that it was so uh, damaging if that's the right word so destructive that I could no longer compare what had happened a minute before like if we say this moment here is uh, <laughs> nice cat yeah. this moment here is the moment of the car horn uh -huh. And uh, this is the point after, this is the point before. It's almost that the break was complete. Hmm. So I could not compare to what had been before. So I had no way of really knowing that something was wrong in the sense. Uh, everything was different. But I couldn't call it uh, blissful or I couldn't call it uh, love or pure this or pure that or whatever people tend to call those things. I couldn't call it that because I couldn't remember the life before. Huh. So it was more destructive in the sense that um, in some strange way a bridge was burned and it was really difficult to go back. There are memories, but uh, even as I speak of this now, uh, it, it almost feels like I'm lying to you because there's no real way to know for sure. There's no way that I can even begin to tell you that what happened that day was the truth, you know. So because there is no real uh, personality that's grasping to these memories to make them into something, you know. Right. We've heard the saying that, um, you know, we have these events in our life and people say this event made me who I am mm -hmm. or these circumstances made me who I am. There was no longer a need for those memories to be important. So right. I, I wouldn't say that they were lost, but it's almost that they kind of tumble out of reach. It's kind of difficult to latch on to something for very long. And I think looking back on that day, looking back on the person that might have been before that moment, um, it's really hard to say with any real accuracy. You know, sometimes I have memories of 
the time before, and there will be people in them that I know that I still know today, and I'll have to ring them up and ask them, uh, I had this memory, did this actually happen? Mm -hmm. And they'll either confirm it or they'll say, well, I don't really remember that, or they'll say, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> You know, because I've had to ask my mother this and friends from school. So I think uh, some of them are kind of accustomed to those sort of questions, and the others that aren't too keen just have gone away. I well, guess. certainly you didn't become a tabula rasa. I mean, you, you remembered if, if someone had asked you, you know, where you went to school or things like that, you would have been able to answer, right? And, I mean, you knew you still knew how to drive a car and tie your shoes and <laughs> brush your teeth. and You know, you still knew how to read and talk. And so basically mm -hmm. all of the skills and, and essential memories that you had had before this incident, you must still have had. But, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but, uh, but what, I'm, what I'm getting at or what you're getting at is that the, the rememberer, the shoe tire, the driver, the person <clears throat> who was predominant in your awareness, who you know did all those things, that seemed to have flown the coop. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, nothing really happened to the knowledge right. that was gained up to that point. You know, you still know your phone number. You still yeah. know where you live. You still know your mom's name or whatever. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's almost as if the the identity the person that all these memories mean something to always has to keep them very close at hand like they're all sitting in a desk in front of them and um, these things are easy to reach out for it gives that kind of security it solidifies the person mm -hmm. as the person believes themselves to be or oh, here's this you know I'm intelligent because of this or I'm a failure because of this or I'm handsome because of this or whatever it happens to be but in this case uh, the, the memories of the events are still there, but there is no real story tied to them. You know, it's just something that might have happened. And they're not always in reach. And what I mean by that is, uh, if you can, uh, I, I don't, you know, I, I have these analogies a lot, and I don't know if they make sense. But if you imagine it similar to the be what the scientists say is the beginning of the universe, where you had this... Um, whatever they call it, the primordial uh, molecule or whatever they say. And it was held in place supposedly by gravity and the weak and strong nuclear forces and uh, uh, electromagnetism or whatever it is. And for whatever reason, it just broke apart and all this infinite expansion. Well, if you could think of the self as the same way, it is this tightly compressed ball, this uh, believer, this desirer, the wanter, the the person that wants that continuity, you know, they want to live as long as they can. They want to have this. They want to live after death. They want to go on in all these other ways. And they're held in place by these unseen forces. And uh, all of the consciousness, all of the knowledge, everything that makes up that person is contained all within that small uh, molecule, we could say. But for some reason, it just exploded. So it's not that uh, everything is gone, but it's so it's it seems so expansive sometimes. It's hard to make yourself into something solidified again. So it's and, as if the container went from being a bucket to being an ocean. Yes. Yeah. So it's not that the memories are gone. It's not that the knowledge is gone. And knowledge is something uh, slightly different from the memories I found, but uh, the memories just kind of. It, it, yeah, like an ocean, like you said, it just floats in, it floats out, and there's no real need to hold on or to grasp it. But the organism still functions. There's no problems with that sort of thing. And um, it's not that one becomes a vegetable or one becomes <clears throat> mute necessarily, but there is, uh, for lack of a better word, a space it might be all space, it might be all thing, I, I really don't know how to describe it. You know, the words always seem to fail. Mm. But... Uh, how about vastness? How's that for a word? That, no, that, that works as, <laughs> as good as any other, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so it's not that they're gone, it's just not necessarily in reach, you know. It might not be this desk, it might be in the other apartment on another desk, you know. Mm. It's not necessarily here in front of me. 
but uh, so I it, seem to have survived the last three or four years. So, so this only happened three or four years ago. Yeah. Uh, it was December 1st, 2006. Yes. Were you married at the time? I got married that year in the summer. Okay. And uh, how did you end up in Japan? Well, we were already on the way here. We I see. had already decided we were going to live here, mm -hmm. at least for a, a sizable chunk of time. And um, we left Boston for Japan the following month. It was in January. Right. And what do you do for a living? Well, uh, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, on, honestly, I mean, I don't, yeah. I don't have a boss. I don't go to, you know, work in that sense. So mm -hmm. really, um, I've just lived off of uh, the monies I've had in the bank account, and mm -hmm. yeah. So technically, really, in the sense of a, you know, a person going to work, nothing. Okay. And so, what do you do all day long? Well, these days, my time is taken up mostly with. Um, it used to be all writing. Mm -hmm. But then at some point, uh, something uh, seemed to change, and I wasn't really so interested in the written word as much as I was before. And uh, I never go back and read what I've written before, but a few months ago, I went into the archives just to take a look at what was there. And the earlier posts on the site are very thick, yeah. are very heavy. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a lot of words, a lot of words, a lot of words. And then when I look at the most recent posts, it might just be a sentence. Uh -huh. So for whatever reason, I think there was a, a reduction in uh, words almost to the point where now it just uh, I'm not interested in that anymore. So I've been using a lot of my time now just for speaking uh -huh. uh, through Skype like this, although this is the first recorded video uh -huh. uh, that I've ever done. Do you usually but, just have sort of one-on-one -on -one little chats with people? Yep, that's yeah. how it's been going so far. Uh -huh. And there have been some meetings with larger groups, but uh, right. it's generally all online. So, it, so basically, in your writing and your speaking with people, you're you're sort of fu you're functioning as uh, you probably don't like the term. You're functioning as sort of a spiritual teacher. In other words, you're writing about your experience. You're help. You're you're talking to people about your experience, and presumably with the hope of helping them to get more clear in their own experience is that is that the motivation well i've never gone out uh seeking for people i right. think people just found me through the writing and right. it just kind of grows and it has grown grown since then uh -huh. and of course we'll post the, a link to your website and everything on uh, you know um, on batgap.com so people will be able to go there and read and interact with you but um, and I haven't actually read the stuff yet but I'd be interested to take a look at it but so basically in, in doing that writing you are just kind of unpacking your experience I presume you're you're trying to explain what happened to you and make sense of it and convey it to others is that is that a fair assessment no I think it's more that I wanted to find a way to function with words again, in a sense. I wanted to almost relearn how to speak after that huh. event took place. So, I mean, I, I didn't lose the ability to speak. It right. wasn't as if I had no words or anything. But I was hoping to maybe find a way to express w what had happened in some kind of clear way, not necessarily to build a teaching or to build a system for other people to right. follow. Just to make because sense to make sense of it, even just to yourself, if if not to <laughs> others, correct? I mean, yes, and that that might have been why the progression of uh, had happened with the reduction in the words. There was just you know no amount of words can do it. The the less the better, I think. Yeah. In some cases. <laughs> Did you find in doing how, how much have you written? I mean, reams and reams of stuff over the last several years. Yeah, I've written more on paper than I have on the site, but uh -huh. I think on the site it's maybe 270 different posts uh -huh. on varying topics. Uh -huh. Yeah, and um, and the stuff on paper, do you have you published that, or do you intend to in any way, or do you just kind of do it for your own gratification? Uh, I have not published any of that. I think some of that I have put on the site, yeah. but I have not. I have no real desire. I mean, if that stuff was burned in a fire, I really wouldn't care. Yeah. 
and I, I don't mean to say that uh, uh, I don't mean to seem maybe ungrateful to the word, but if I'm writing something for the website, once it's up, and assuming that there's no the factual errors that I need to correct. Once it's up, it's done. It's gone. Yeah. You know, it, 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 as far as I'm concerned, it, it never really happened. So it's like a technique for you, a process for you, and, and you're not really overly attached to, you know, the historical record of it or anything like that. I yeah, have, it doesn't really mean anything to me in that sense. Yeah. You know. I have a friend who, who has very, profound level of experience and I'd love to interview him so far he hasn't been willing to go public um, but I've had some long fascinating conversations with him but he he writes reams and reams of stuff and he says it just really helps him to kind of clarify his own thinking about what he's experiencing and and actually to perhaps clarify the experiences themselves to to you know the two seem to go together. There, there, mm -hmm. There's a scrutiny, a kind of a self-scrutiny that takes place through the writing process that enables him to see the finer details of his experience um, more and more. Would, would you concur? Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, and and um, I don't know, the the difficulty with that, and it's, it's nothing that anyone can control, mm -hmm. is that um, a reader of that sort of material might want to make it into something. You know, mm -hmm. they might see it as a state to to have. So then, I think the words lose their meaning in that yeah. case, because then, you know, they're made into something more than what they were maybe never intended to be meant for. Well, my own experience in reading stuff that other people have written or in listening to talks that they have given and so on is that it's there's sort of a uh, you know an enlivening effect in my own experience. It. it um, you know, some there's some resonance. I, I listen to you know, I'll read Eckhart Tolle or whoever, Bajashanti, different people. I listen to stuff all the time on various podcasts, and it just sort of stimulates ways of seeing things and thinking about things and expressing things uh, that may not have occurred to me, or it it actually brings to light maybe facets of my own experience that I hadn't noticed so clearly but you know someone articulates it beautifully and you think oh yeah I can relate to that I know what he's talking about um, so you know I think what you're doing is probably very beneficial for people who find it beneficial who who you know with whom it resonates and others you know might not be their cup of tea and they'll they'll find inspiration elsewhere but you know the fact that you know you, you have gotten fairly busy talking to people and, and so on indicates perhaps that people do find it useful. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, what I was surprised with is that the topics vary so widely. You know, uh, I think in the beginning, uh, speaking of the site, uh, all of the questions were about enlightenment this or enlightenment that or getting there or what to do to get there, that sort of thing. But the people I've met recently are so wonderful in the way they explore their own minds mm. you know they're interested in communication they're interested in the word itself they're interested in um, more so how I think they're functioning than just looking for a state to kind of apply to themselves right yeah and uh, I never really knew before that people were that serious if that's the right way to put it uh -huh. uh, because over the years um, uh, speaking with some people or writing certain things, people are very quick to come out and tell you, well, you're wrong. You know? <laughs> they want their point to be made and they want to say, well, you're wrong because of this, this, and this, uh -huh. and this is right because you're wrong about this. And uh -huh. uh, So I maybe I assumed that that would just continue to a much higher degree when you know I spoke to more and more people. Yeah. But that hasn't really happened, which... Uh, has surprised me. I think people are, a lot of people are interested in finding out how they function as human beings, which I think is a wonderful place for any exploration to begin. Yeah, I think, you know, being less judgmental is a sign of spiritual maturity, and perhaps you're running into people now who are more spiritually mature and are not so quick to say, I'm right, you're wrong. You know, mm. I think it was the Buffalo Springfield who said, nobody's right if everybody's wrong. Um, mm -hmm. That that song might have been before your time, but um, <laughs> so what were you? 
No, you can, if, if, if I kind of ask a question that gets you off of a track that you feel you're developing, feel free to, to say, no, let's not go there yet. But uh, okay. it, I'm curious to know, um, what were you doing before this incident happened? I mean, what kind of profession did you have, uh, if any, or what were your interests? What was your life like? Well, I always had a job um, somewhere, and uh, in Boston, I worked mostly in hardware stores, and then uh, that lasted for a good four or five years, and then I worked in uh, um, a vitamin kind of sports supplement store mm -hmm. for another, you know, two different uh, of those kind of stores for another four or so years and I would always had a job I'd always you know I never really thought of um, any of that as a career but uh, I think I was the kind of person that had the sort of mind where they just needed the money to survive right you know? there was never any great looking forward to something I mean the there might have been some idea of things that I'd wanted to do in the future but um, I don't think I was really that kind of person, the uh, business go-getter type person. Right. And I was just interested in maybe more survival than uh, thriving for whatever reason. So you're just living a normal life, working a job, and living doing normal things, going to baseball mm -hmm. games or whatever you enjoyed doing. Um, yeah. And uh, did you have any kind of inkling of spiritual type things? Did you ever read a spiritual book or... Uh, you know anything like that or was that just in a whole nother universe and you never gave it a thought well uh, I have some story about that uh -huh. um, I was always interested uh, in Bruce Lee uh -huh. when I was a kid and um, I saw all his movies of which there are only four mm -hmm. if you don't count all the exploitation flicks that were done with his name <laughs> Did you practice um, martial, martial arts yourself, or you just like No, that? no, not at all. I, I was just really interested in what he had to say as a human being and uh, his philosophy, which I think extends far greater than the Jeet Kune Do that he had created, you know, in his short life. But uh, I remember uh, it was in maybe around 1990. Nine or 2000, I was living in Quincy, Massachusetts, and I had just bought this uh, DVD of uh, all of the lost footage of the film he was making when he died, which w turned out to be The Game of Death, which they mm. was terrible. And uh, they had put all the original footage together using his own notes, and it was very interesting. Mm. But during the interviews with his widow, she had said that uh, Bruce was... Uh, there was a time in his life when he had a great injury and he wasn't able to do anything physical for maybe six or seven months at a time. Mm -hmm. And what he had done then was just read the great works of the world and uh, all sorts of spiritual teachers like Alan Watts and the Buddha and, mm -hmm. and also Krishnamurti, which uh, his widow said was probably had the greatest influence on his thinking. So me being into Bruce Lee, I thought, well, I'm going to check out Krishnamurti. Mm -hmm. So I went to a bookstore in Boston, and at the time, uh, I was working in Harvard Square and, and living in Quincy, and that is close to an hour uh, train ride. So one day after work, I went out and bought this Krishnamurti book and uh, just started reading it there at work. And I, you know, it's one of those things where you just leave it, and then you pick it up and read it every once in a while, and leave it and pick it up every once in a while. And one day after work, I decided, well, I'm just going to sit here and read this, because it was very... Uh, I don't know how to explain it. Very thick, the words. It was kind of hard for me to get. I would have to go back and read sentences again yeah. and again. And <clears throat> like, what is he talking about? Because I didn't really know the language the way that he was using it. But eventually I stuck with it and got about halfway through the book, and something struck me uh, interesting, and I, I'm paraphrasing because I can't remember what he had said, but um, he had said that to see truth that must not come through the eyes of another or through the words of another even the words of the speaker of himself and um, that hit me really hard and I thought if that's true why the hell am I even reading this book <laughs> I mean what really what am I doing so I got on the train and went back to Quincy and it was about a 45 minute trip and the whole time I didn't open the book I was just thinking about that 
on a lot of different levels about finding out for yourself about not being dependent on uh, some other entity you know to to live your life for you and I got out of the train at Quincy and the first thing I did was I threw that book in the trash hmm. and I just went home and just thought about this for the longest time. And I think my life was normal. It, it wasn't, uh, nothing really changed except for maybe something screwy happened up here, you know. And uh, from that point on, I've never really read another uh, spiritual book. Even if that book is considered uh, spiritual teaching, I'm not really sure. It was kind of. Uh, yeah, Christian Murdy was considered that. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. So. Uh, and even after your awakening, that didn't change. You had no desire to sort of see if others had experienced something or if, you, if what you were experiencing was what all these other people were talking about or, or what terminology people had found to express this more clearly. Didn't that kind of uh, interest you? I think I was curious, but I think that was taken care of by um, all of the interaction that I was having on the website. I see. Uh, because I was able to meet so many great people there and uh, you know there's no forum or anything like that so it's not technically a community but there's maybe a core uh, commenting force of between 20 and 30 people yeah and uh, from speaking with them and checking out their websites I think I'm able to see that um, what did occur is not necessarily uh, uncommon in a sense because there, there are all sorts of different flavors it seems you know there's uh, uh, people that have practiced for years and something happened. There are people that are highly religious and something happened. There are people that are drug addicts and something has happened, you know, or nothing has happened, however you want to say it. So um, having met all those people, I really can't see that there could ever be a formula. You know, it's so varied. It's so... Uh, interesting it's so um, unique to the person and I think part of that is that uh, the way that they function the way that they see the world the way that it comes to them uh, those things are inherent in all of us as human beings all of us do that you know all of us can see and we can perceive and we can do this and that but the way that it happens to each person is unique yeah so the functioning is not unique but the way it appears to the person is. And I think that that is something that's so incredible about the people that uh, speak on these things or even uh, the serious people that call themselves spiritual seekers. You know, you can see those different flavors. You can feel them. You know, it's almost like uh, you can sense a, a field about a person. And I don't want to use those kind of, you know, uh, terms. I don't want to make it sound all magical or anything. Uh, but it expresses itself it's almost like um, you know awakening people it's almost like uh, going to the museum and looking at different paintings mm -hmm. you know you each have this expression and you know some people can gravitate to something immediately and other people might say well it's not for me but uh, in each case there is some unique expression within a completely limited medium and I think that is uh, something that's very amazing about this whole trip it is. Um, you know, definitely one size does not fit all. I mean, um, and I get the sense that you would not discount or um, dismiss the value of spiritual practices if people, oh, sure. if people are attracted to them. And, you know, and, uh, but we're not all going to become Muslims or fundamentalist Christians or Buddhists or meditators or Qigong practitioners or whatever. There's, there's just a whole... Uh, you know, uh, potpourri or what are those things? Cornucopia of different uh, of different practices, and uh, yeah, I mean, if you look at creation, I'll, I'll I'll pontificate here for a second. I mean, if you look at creation itself, you watch nature shows on TV or something. Uh, it, it, I always marvel at the, the the creativity of what I regard as God. I mean, when you look at all the types of animals and and so many interesting things. You look into astronomy and you see, you see how fascinating and vast the universe is with so much diversity and so much going on. You think, wow, you know, the intelligence behind this universe really likes variety and diversity. 
definitely mm-hmm. not a, a you know plain vanilla kind of god i mean the, everything is is so amazingly creative and diverse from the macroscopic down to the microscopic and everything in between so you know why shouldn't why shouldn't spiritual practice or spiritual progress be the same way you know mm-hmm. obviously obviously we as human beings are very unique each of us is so different so why shouldn't our paths be unique and different and and you know each carved out of our you know a different mold whatever i mean imagine the world if that were the case throughout humanity you know if that had completely spread like a virus if we were all living in that uh, whatever you call it that uh, expressive uh, potential awakened you know. state or whatever you mean mm-hmm. yeah. yeah because there are, there are far more followers than there are uh, uh, I don't know how to say it uh, realizers well I've always said that the world doesn't really need Christians or Buddhists and so on it needs Christ's and Buddha's yeah good point <laughs> you know yeah. so uh, each one of us has this unique uh, offering if I can call right. it that way and Christ or, and Buddha said that by the way I mean they all said you could get you could become like I am you know and even Christ said even greater things you, you could do um, and you know Buddha said similar things the whole world is awakened we're all Buddhists and you know and it's it's not even a matter of imagining I don't think because I, it seems to be happening I mean sometimes it doesn't if you look at the six o'clock news it seems to be pretty messed up but um, if you listen to the right sources and look put your attention in the right places you know awakening seems to be spreading like an epidemic I mean the very fact that you had that awakening you know while startled by a car uh, might not have happened 50 years ago or 100 years ago. It, it, maybe the atmosphere in the world just wasn't so conducive to such a thing, although I'm sure such things have happened to people throughout history, but it almost seems like it's getting more possible now, you know, and more mm-hmm. commonplace. Well, there are still, uh, because of society or because of the culture, there are still consequences to expressing... Uh, not necessarily this sort of thing, but any kind of freedom that is uh, uh, very specific to the individual, if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, uh, I grew up in a place that was very religious, although my family wasn't necessarily very religious. So the way that I have spoken before or the way that I might have written things has caused some of those people just to turn away. Yeah. You know? And I, I think the problem is not... You mean old it, friends and family? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they just think you've gone off the deep end or something? Yeah, well, not so much family, but uh, certain friends for yeah. sure. People that you'd think would... You know, it's, you know, when you're a kid, you think you're going to live forever. Mm-hmm. And you think that all the friends that you have in sixth grade are going to be there when you're 70, you right, know, which right. is not... You know, it's absolutely not the case. Yeah. But uh, some of them have been vocal about it, and others just... You know, it's not for them, and they just turn away, and that's fine either way. But uh, a problem with all of these things is uh, the interpretation of the word. People get so hung up on the word because they believe it to mean something else. And it's just a pure expression of the person. Hopefully, it's just a pure expression of the person. But many people want to make that into something because it's very difficult for them to relate to another human being without first making them into something yeah. then they kind of know where they stand it's like well he is this kind of person so that makes me this so now I know how to respond it's like you know? they want to sort of fit you into a conceptual framework so they know what what to make of you you know they, they want to understand you and so they think they're trying to sort of fit you into something that is within their realm of experience correct but mm-hmm. uh, but if if what you're experiencing is is outside of their realm of experience, then it might be easy to misinterpret you. I mean, that certainly mm-hmm. happened to many of the the great spiritual leaders throughout history. They've all gotten stoned or crucified or you know criticized by people who just you know they were so out far so far outside the mainstream that they couldn't help but stir up controversy, you know, because mm-hmm. they just didn't fit the mold. Um, now, where we live, um, you're in the United States, I'm in Japan, we're, maybe we can be victims of a mild kind of persecution, you know? I mean, we're not going to be, probably not going to be strung up, you know, probably not going to be 
you know, beaten on the street for the things we when say. When you say Although we, in, do you mean you in Japan? I, I just mean, yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm talking about both of us oh, both in the of United us. States okay, yeah. and in Japan. You know, um, but there are maybe societal consequences, if I can put it mm -hmm. that way, because uh, once you start speaking out about the way things are in the world or about uh, uh, if you happen to explore yourself to a depth that doesn't quite match what the current popular teaching says, then yeah. you're out. You know, yeah. you're alone in that you're, sense. Not, not loneliness, not like you're being targeted or anything, but... Uh, in a sense, you're kind of out, if that makes any well, sense. Well, you may be out of one group, but you'll f there there will be others. I mean, you know, obviously there are thousands, if not millions, of people interested in this kind of stuff these days, and uh, birds of a feather will flock together. I mean, you you found it yourself. You put up a website, start writing stuff, and you f you start meeting all these fascinating people all over the place that really get what you're saying, you know, or that want to get what you're saying, and and uh, so. You know, I would just say, you know, it's like I, I, I've been in touch with certain friends who, uh, you know, I went to high school with and, and, and so on. And, you know, some of them are kind of doing the same old thing, uh, you know, uh, that they were 50 years ago, 40, 45 years ago. But others have sort of moved along in, in various ways. And, uh, I don't know, I'm just sort of I'm rambling here, but I, I think it's, there may have been a time when, you know, you would have been burned at the stake for talking the way you're talking, uh, or, you know, but these days I think the, the society at large is, there are too many examples of people experiencing this kind of thing and writing about it and talking about it, and it's just, it's, like it or not, and we like it, but and most, some people some people don't. But like it or not, or, or not, it's finding it's it's rapidly finding its way into the mainstream, and in some ways becoming the mainstream. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's still not you know, Bible Belt Middle America necessarily. But uh, hey, I live in Middle America and uh, in a town where a couple few thousand people practice meditation. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, this kind of thing wasn't happening in the 50s so much. <laughs> That's true. Aside from maybe Yogananda and a couple of other things, but mm -hmm. well, I'm not sure. Uh, I I wasn't sure if I would be able to relate to other people in that sense, other spiritual teachers or spiritual seekers, because I really have no knowledge of that world. But I found out that really the knowledge is not so important. I think, yeah, because you don't necessarily have to read a book about the mind to find out about your own mind. Good point. I mean, it's there. Yeah. I mean, we can see it. You know, the problem might be the seeing, but it's there for us to see. Yeah. So I wasn't sure that I would be able to uh, uh, communicate effectively, or mm -hmm. uh, even be able to come together with some of these people. But I found that that's really not the case. That's not the case. Yeah. yeah. Do you yourself ever feel the need of any guidance or a teacher or anything? Do you, always, do you ever feel like, well, I've, I've progressed to this extent, but there are so many things I still don't know, and maybe I should find somebody who knows more than I do who could, you know, lead me on or something? Has that ever happened? I've never had that feeling. No. Uh, I understand and I respect what other people are teaching about, but I've never felt... Uh, empty in that yeah. sense. So I've never felt wanting and the need to find out about what might be going on here because I'm still not sure that we can be aware of anything other than our own functioning. Hmm. And uh, other people have said, talk about that as being in the moment or whatever people might say. But uh, there are many beautiful things in this world and there are, you know, physically speaking, uh, we're physically situated in specific points of space mm -hmm. and uh, you know, we can't literally say that we are the table, you know, right. that is here because, you know, it's clearly we're not the table. But uh, there is something so completely unifying, if that's the right phrase about this, that there's never, I've never noticed a desire to, uh, I don't know, to find out more mm -hmm. or to, uh, to seek out that sort of... Uh, teaching. I've read some articles and that people send me over the years and I've watched a few videos here and there, but uh, it's it's never enough to really 
uh, push me in any sort of direction or to even make uh, a mark, it seems. But uh, I enjoy what I've read. It's very, uh, it's very interesting. It's lovely that people can come up with these, not come up with, but um, express, express these things yeah. at um, varying uh, levels of clarity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, do you feel, nonetheless, that um, there is some kind of progress taking place in some dimension? I mean, since that day in Massachusetts when you had that awakening, do you, do you feel like things have somehow deepened or clarified or and and are continuing to do so well i've noticed certain things but i can't and it may in fact be a progression but i can't see it uh maybe if i look back mm -hmm. and try and take some measurement of how things have gone then i could see a progression but um, at the time when you're living there is no progression you know at the moment that you're breathing and expressing whatever we're expressing here at this time there is right. no real progression you know this is kind of a expressive uh, moment in time if yeah. we can put it that way uh, but the, the only way i can be aware of some sort of progression is by looking back and i'm not very good at that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i have some yeah. difficulty so in other words but some progression think, may be taking place but you're just not in the habit of paying attention to it or you know or trying to compare you know last year with this year so as to sort of fathom what it might be I think I don't know how to pay attention to it mm. in that sense the wheels just it don't may, turn that way it, it may be going on and yeah. I think the only way we can see it is if someone tells me that it's going on mm. or that if I can look at the a pie chart or something yeah. and it can tell me you were here in 2006 and this and this and this and this and this because you know there is progression physically as human beings we age or we get better at certain things sure. or uh, we can you know learn how to drive a car better or learn how to manipulate people better with our words or, you know whatever it happens to be there's always some mm -hmm. kind of skill acquisition or progression or something but uh, this thing that we're talking about uh, I don't know how to see it in that yeah. Sense. But I think I can only see it in terms of the past, you know. I mean, if you think about being in the moment, really, where is the moment? Mm -hmm. I mean, there is no moment to be in, right. in, that, in that sense, because the moment you think about it, it becomes a moment, <laughs> you know. It becomes something that you look back on, Yeah. you know. So, uh, it just it strikes me as strange, you know. Many things uh, strike me as strange in that way. Mm. when I hear certain people say things and it could just be my interpretation of the words you know it might be nothing you know we may be saying exactly the same thing mm -hmm. but just in a slightly different way so I found it's always important to always ask the other person well, what do you mean what are you saying yeah like how what, what do you mean with this do you mean this or that and uh, many people are good about explaining themselves other people aren't too keen on it but mm. uh, well, the reason I asked that question is that um, some people are averse to this idea of progress, uh, spiritual progress. They, they, they don't believe in levels of consciousness. They don't believe in, you know, levels of evolution. They, they, they sort of say, all you have to do is realize, you know, your essential nature, and that's it. You're done. And, uh, you know, and sometimes people who actually start out saying that later on begin to say, now wait a minute. Uh, actually, things are. You know, deepening, clarifying. There, there does seem to be some further development taking place, and um, you know, and just kind of judging from my own experience, that there's, you know, there's always a, a sense in my life of uh, something which is always the same, but at the same time, of something which can, a sense in which things continue to progress or develop or unfold. You know, greater clarity, greater subtlety. Um, things like that um, and so it, it's just a it's a kind of a one of those questions that I often ask my guests just because I'm curious about it and uh, well you know more about this than I do and uh, I'm sometimes I'm confused when people talk about levels yeah so uh, when someone I'm not saying that it's false um, but when people talk about levels or stages in consciousness, what are they usually? What do they usually mean? Are they talking about well, someone that robs a bank is at a lower level of consciousness, but I help feed the homeless, so I'm at a higher one? <laughs> or is it something? I mean, I don't understand. Yeah. So. Well, actually, um, 
there are various teachers who've articulated this in different ways, and you know, and, and uh, you know, you can read various people like Ken Wilber or others. But um, my understanding of it is that uh, you know, you could think of the human nervous system as a, a reflector or an expressor uh, of our essential nature, and um, in in it's in our essential nature nature itself, if, if we want to call that pure consciousness or whatever, uh, there are no levels. I mean, reality is what it is. The essential nature of life is what it is. Uh, but in terms of its uh, expressions and in terms of our ability to express or reflect it or know it within ourselves, there can be many stages of progress. A person might initially have glimpses of it. Uh, eventually, it might be stabilized, and so it's there all the time. Uh, there's, a, you know, the pure awareness even when they're fast asleep, perhaps. Uh, later on, there could be some refinement of their perception, uh, such that they begin to, you know, see uh, much subtler levels of, of experience through their senses. Later on, there could be, uh, you know, a sense of, you know seeing the self, everything as the self, a kind of unitive experience. And these things don't necessarily happen in, in a sequential way, uh, just as I outlined them. They might ha happen in a different sequence, or they might, it might come all at once, or whatever. Uh, but uh, So I, I think when we speak of levels of awareness, strictly speaking, that's an erroneous concept, because awareness itself doesn't have levels. But the uh, you know appreciation of it, or ability to experience it might develop in, or, or, uh, over time as a person evolves in, in that sense. Um, and, you know, sometimes when people say there are no levels and then, you know, pure consciousness is the only thing and it, it's, it's, it's bogus to, to talk of, of levels, I sometimes think, I think of like, you know, someone saying, well, it's all, the whole universe is only <clears throat> atoms and there are no molecules, there are no cells, there are no uh, organs, there are no bodies, it's all just atoms. And on some level, they're right. I mean, you can, you can take your liver and analyze it carefully enough, and sure enough, it's just atoms. <laughs> you know, Eventually, it's all space. <laughs> yeah, and, and even beneath the atom level, they're you know, subatomic, and, and you get down to the vacuum state or, or you know, unified field or whatever. But, you know, it's th this attempt to sort of take a particular strata of creation and say, that's the only reality seems fundamentalist to me. Uh, be, uh, even though you might, you know, stepping back, you might say, fine, you're right, it's only atoms. But that doesn't negate the fact that there's also, you know, molecules and cells and organs and bodies and trees and, and all the diversity. Uh, all those things. And, you know, some, some might say, well, that's all an illusion. It's all just unmanifest being. But the great sages that I have understood, to the extent I've understood them, you know, tend to acknowledge the paradox of life, that it's both, you know, that, uh, you know, there is this universal reality which is all consuming and, and which everything can ultimately be analyzed down to uh, in terms of its essential constituents. But uh, at the same time, it's legitimate to acknowledge the existence and reality of, of all these expressions. And if we don't do so, you can get you into trouble because you can begin to misapply the understanding of one level of consciousness to another level of consciousness. You might say, well, the world is only an illusion, therefore it really doesn't matter if I rob this bank, you know, mm -hmm. or, or if I do this to this person or something. It's all just a play of consciousness, you know. It's, it's not real. Um, and there are people who actually do that and say that, you know. They, they sort of feel, it, it, it sort of, they, f they feel they can get away with, um, you know, not acknowledging mor certain moral values and so on because it's all an illusion. <laughs> uh, anyway, well, those I, sort I, of I, things are, I think those sort of things are done out of their own selfishness. Yeah. Their desire to maybe do whatever the hell they want to do. Which is you rationalized know, and given some kind of cosmic justification, you know. And that's a hell of an excuse, isn't it? Yeah. It's all an illusion. Yeah. yeah kind of a game the ego plays. And I'm not accusing well, you of this, of course. I'm just, we're just playing with the concepts. Mm. Um, I, I can see... Um, I have a better understanding now that you've explained it a little bit here. And I can see both 
uh, I, I don't see that they have to be separate. Right. I mean, uh, there may be atoms at the bottom of everything or other molecules or whatever, mm -hmm. and there may be a tree over here, mm -hmm. but it's all a part of the whole. Yeah. Exactly. And it's, you know, it's not something that can be, I mean, you can say, you know, there's an atom here in this little uh, mechanical doodad. You can see all the atoms here and there's a tree over here. Mm -hmm. You know, you can say that, but it's all a part of the same, the, the same thing in, in, that, in that sense. You know, it's all yeah. the universe or it's all the, you know, whatever you want to call it. So I think the difficulty uh, for me in the past was seeing a level as something that, uh, uh, maybe as a fixed or a static point, right. or it's an inevitability uh, that a person uh, has to be here. It's almost as if, you know, we have this game of life uh, by the cosmic Parker brothers or something, <laughs> and we have to go through, the, oh, you have to go back to study. You know, it's like we have to do these certain things. Yeah. It's all a part of the whole, so I can see that it is there, but I can also see that maybe it's not so important in, in, in another sense. Yeah. Know? I suppose the analogy of an ocean might be helpful in which, you know, certainly there are levels to the ocean, uh, but it's all water, you know, and, the, and the, the wholeness of the ocean, which is all water, contains all this other stuff all the, and all these, all these other levels. And uh, no one level of the ocean negates the rest of the ocean. All the, you know, it's all contained within, within the one whole. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that maybe part of that difficulty also is that... Um, I can't stop and define it in, in that sense, you know. If I'm here now, I can't define that as a particular stage or level, although someone from the outside might look in and say, oh, it's this or it's that or it's yeah. whatever. That's fine. You know, I'm not denying any of that. But I can't see it either through my own deficiency or an inability to see or um, it just doesn't appear in life in that sense. It doesn't appear meaning... Um, um, it's not really, it's not a conscious thought, you know, it's not like I'm thinking of being at a certain level so I no. act in a certain way. And I don't think anybody ever does if they're, mm. if they're sincere and genuine, you know, it's not like, oh, I'm at such and such a level, therefore I should do this. Uh, but people, you know, in order to understand things, people like to kind of categorize and, and define. And, and so we have this term self-realization to try to give a label to what you apparently have experienced. And then, you know, people have, uh, have come up with other labels for, you know, further stages of development that they have discovered beyond the initial stage of self-realization and so on. And in, in India, which is kind of like, you know, the Eskimos have, what, tw 20 or 30 names for snow. In India, mm -hmm. they, they have all kinds of very specific terms for all these subtle distinctions and, and gradations of, of, of experience and awareness because that culture had a history of focusing on this kind of stuff so much so that they've, you know, evolved an intricate and elaborate, you know, uh, structure of knowledge around it. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's, it's interesting in your case because you just kind of stumbled into this innocently, uh, you know, almost literally, just sort of bingo, you <laughs> had this awakening. And, and it's, it's kind of interesting that you're kind of, you're evolving your own understanding of it without a lot of feedback from people who've you know you know books that are thousands of years old or people who you know dwell on this all the time you're just kind of you know building it out of your own experience and that's kind of an interesting way to go you know i'm not uh, i'm not knocking it at all i think it's uh it's kind of a fascinating we were talking earlier about every all the different flavors of of awakening mm -hmm, based yeah. upon so this is your flavor this is your approach and who knows <laughs> you know maybe maybe uh Five years from now, you'll become a bookworm, and you'll be reading everything you can get your hands on. You know. To, yeah, to, yeah. You never know. You I mean, a know. minute from now, I could die. I mean, yeah. You never know. What you could is die, what or you could actually lose this awakening you had. Who knows? I mean, due due to some physical change or something or other. I mean, people, that does happen. I have one friend who was actually skiing down a very steep slope in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and suddenly had an awakening, much like the one you had. And uh, and he enjoyed this awakening for about three years. Uh, and he, he used to, his name is Dan, and he used to sometimes refer to himself as, well, there's Big Dan and there's Little Dan. I mean, there's this cosmic sort of vastness. And then there's, you know, this guy who's living this life who does this, who's married to so-and-so. That, that was Little Dan. And then one day, Big Dan got lost. Uh, and he, he came in totally despondent because he no longer had this uh, vast awareness that he had enjoyed for three years. So I don't know why he got it 
fl- coming down a ski slope, and I don't know why it went away. But uh, among all the possible things that can happen to people, that seems to be one of them. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I think over the years, um, and again, it's probably my own inability to explain myself well, but through the writing, I think people have, some people got the impression that uh, I was against it. I'm meaning against studying other teachers or reading those kind right. of books, that sort of thing, which I have no feeling against that sort of I thing. I don't get that impression and from you. you know, I mean, I haven't yeah, read I mean, your website, but you seem very open-minded about allowing people to do whatever they do. And uh, there might be a day, maybe, who knows, you know, next week I might be at a bookstore and say, what the hell, this uh, book looks interesting, why not find out what this person said? Yeah. You know? And you never know what... Uh, can really happen with those sort of things, but uh, I think something that I used to emphasize, if I can remember correctly, was that uh, it's in, it's important to listen to everyone. Yeah. But I don't know that it's so important to follow anyone. Good point. In that sense of needing to be at someone's feet. Right. You know, because. Uh, I think you know, for some people that's valuable. It's a stage, mm-hmm. but it's definitely another one of those things that could never be a universal prescription. Yeah, and it's something that you cannot tell to some people. Absolutely not. <laughs> I've I've discovered. Yeah. You know. And incidentally, regarding books, if Krishnamurti is the only spiritual book you ever read, uh, let me tell you, there's there's a whole world of possibilities out there. You know, he was definitely a lot to wade through, but. Um, mm-hmm. There's, there's, there are a lot of writers that are a lot more lucid and uh, and clear, easy to follow. Well, it's a big world, you yeah. know. I mean, that's like only being introduced to like Jackson Pollock as right. a modernist painter. You know, there's so many other things, and uh, the cultures of certain people might have a some play in that flavoring that we discussed before. Yeah. You know, it's not something to avoid. It's not something to. Uh, necessarily want to destroy your conditioning in that sense. I mean, in one sense, it's valuable to be able to see things without uh, without heavy influence, you know, without some kind of glass that tells you what you're seeing as opposed to remove the glass and just see the damn thing, yeah. you know. But uh, there are certain elements of the way that we're raised or the location that we're born in that can just add such richness to uh, the way we express ourselves. and. Uh, I never want to give an impression to someone that any of that stuff should be denied when you know if it's naturally present. You know, mm-hmm. if one is trying to make it happen, it's going to seem artificial, and you know, people aren't going to believe it anyway. But uh, what's naturally present shouldn't be not denied, even if you know some teacher tells you that it should be. Right. You know, so there is some importance to being able to see this uh, on your own, even when you're kind of absorbing the words of uh, other people or of hearing them speak or you know whatever it happens to be so it's all valuable but uh, in the end uh, we only have ourselves to kind of, you know we see ourselves in the mirror we lay down with ourselves at night you know we have this brain here and you know all these things all this sensory stuff comes in you know every day but in the end it's just us in that sense you know yeah. in that learning sense in that kind of growing sense and we can be influenced but uh we can't really be forced to grow in a particular direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think maybe some sort of clarity is needed or some kind of openness or I don't know the right word. Uh, uh, Some people say allowing. I don't know if that's the right word either. But uh, there needs to be a vitality that's there that you don't usually see when you're trying to block and destroy certain things or trying to accept it so you'll get what you want. There, There needs to be some kind of freedom there that's usually lacking and someone that is trying to uh, make something happen desperately, if that makes any sense to you, if yeah. I'm not rambling. No, you're rambling a little, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was reminded of a Jimi Hendrix quote. He said, he said I'm, I'm, the, I'm the one who's got to die when it's time for me to die, so let me live my life the way I want to. Mm-hmm. That was in one of his songs. But, um, you know, I think... Again, there's, it's a matter of stages. I mean, there are people who are in a stage where it's very natural for them to be extremely dependent uh, mm. a, upon a, you know, a, a, a leader of some sort and not even think for themselves. It just comes naturally to them to be that way, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. And uh, you know, and then 
so they may go on that way all their lives, or they might reach a point at which they do begin to think more independently. And maybe when that happens, they find that it's no long, it no longer fits for them to be in that group or with that teacher or following that politician or whatever it is they've they've uh, aligned themselves with. Um, and in fact, you know, in terms of legitimate spiritual teachers, they're very often very happy where, when a, a student reaches that point where they're ready to graduate, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, and in, for the most, and some, that can take many forms. I mean, they can be booted out or they can lose interest or, you know, they can get attracted by something else or, or whatever. And um, in most cases, uh, you know, what I find is that people who've gone through a transition like that look back with appreciation f for whatever they have gained from that experience or that teacher, uh, but feel like it no longer works for them. You know, no, they, they no longer fit into that. And they might move on to another teacher or they might just be on their own for a while or for the rest of their life or whatever. You know, again, it can take so many forms. Um, and, you know, in your particular case, y you have, you know, had an awakening apparently, which, um, you know, some people beat their head against a wall for 30, 40 years or, and go through all kinds of rigorous disciplines in order to have. And, uh, you know, people hearing you, some of them might be rather envious. Um, but who knows? You know, I mean, if we, if we believe in the theory of reincarnation, you might have been beating your head against a wall for quite a few lifetimes. In, and I'm, that, that's, that's sort of a silly expression. Obviously, that wouldn't be a, a, a legitimate spiritual practice. But you might have spent plenty of time <laughs> meditating and bending yourself into pretzel postures and so on. And, you know, finally you were ready to have that awakening as a result of all that spiritual practice. And it was a car horn that did it. could have been anything else. But it, when, it, when it was time to happen, it happened. Yeah, it's uh, very difficult to say. It is. <laughs> I mean, we, we can't say. <laughs> we can all you know, speculate, and it's, enter it's entertaining to do so. But... Um, mm -hmm. You know, who knows? You know, even after all of this time, these almost four years now, I still enjoy uh, the word. I still enjoy the conversation, the meeting with people, whether yeah. it's just on, on like a, an audio-only Skype call or something like this, or it's meeting people in person. There's something so energetic about conversation. Yeah, you know? I agree. That's kind of why I like to do this show so much. I mean, it really... It gives me a, it boosts me up, it gives me an infu, infu, a weekly infusion. You know? <laughs> yeah, because it's not just a simple matter of waiting your turn, waiting for the other person to shut the hell up so you can make whatever point you have to make. You know, that's not conversation at all. Right. You know, that's just kind of boxing. You know, yeah. you're kind of waiting to get the the right hook in there to drop the person or something. But there's something so vibrant there because it's. Uh, it's like a game of improvisation in mm -hmm. some ways, you know, so there is a, maybe a hint of danger in that sense, you mm -hmm. know, because you never know which way it's going to go, and especially if you're meeting someone for the first time mm -hmm. and you're talking about kind of delicate subjects, yeah. uh, it can be interesting, but there is something so uh, incredible there just between the two people, if it mm -hmm. happens to be two people, that uh, I, I think I really enjoy that. Yeah. I really enjoy being with people, but you know, the last three years I have almost been with no one. Right. You know, there was a lot of. Uh, it's almost like living. Uh, uh, that first year was almost like living a silent retreat without having to pay for one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And but uh, the words eventually came back. But I love words. I yeah. love people, and I love the interaction. It's something. It's very. You know, it can never happen the same way again. I think it also has to do with the topic, you know, that we're discussing. I mean, if we were just having a, an hour and a half conversation about the Red Sox versus the Yankees, um, you know. Go Sox. <laughs> go Yankees. Um, <laughs> it might, I grew up in Connecticut, you know, not too far mm -hmm. from New York City. Uh, it might, uh, I don't think it would have the same effect. I mean, you know, it, there's something kind of enlivening about, uh, it enlivens something subtle to talk about something subtle. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's what satsang is all about, you know, that Sanskrit word, me which means it's basically a sort of a gathering of people for a spiritual discussion. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's considered a spiritual practice in and of itself because it 
it has a, got a kind of a mutually awakening effect among all the participants. Mm-hmm. Well, it is a very uh, liberating effect, if mm-hmm. I can put it that way. You know, it's uh, very easy to get so lost in what's happening but in the interaction. You know, you, it's very easy to forget yourself once mm-hmm. it gets going. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, that is something that might draw people uh, to certain teachers or certain types of uh, gatherings, you know, yeah. because it's easy to, you know, it's not like you're trying to ignore the person you are, you're trying to, you know, reduce yourself, but when you're there, you're there. And uh, that energy is carried amongst all the participants, so it's a beautiful, yeah. uh, it kind of carries itself, you know. It's very and, nice. and very often in, in gatherings like that, people, you know, do have spiritual awakenings, you know, it's sort of like, it's conducive mm-hmm. to it. I mean, it can happen anywhere. It can happen, you know. In fact, there was Maharishi Mahesh Yogi said something sim- that kind of reminded me of your experience. He's, he said, you know, even when the time is right, even the stench of a rotten bus might be the impetus, you know, for your awakening. <laughs> <laughs> of course, in, in your case, it was a near accident that you had, and uh, but and anything can trigger it. But but still, I mean, you're in Japan. There's there's sort of a, a Zen saying which is that. Enlightenment may be an accident, but spiritual practice makes you accident prone. Um, <laughs> and uh, since we're talking about a spiritual sangha or satsang or, or gathering or interaction between people uh, focusing on this particular topic, uh, you know that that in itself is known as a means of of, um, of stimulating or eliciting that sort of thing, that sort of awakening. Well, the seeking, although I was never a spiritual seeker, I think it would be wrong to say I was never a seeker. You know, we can seek, you know, thousands of different things. And I don't see much of a difference between seeking one thing or seeking another thing, mm. uh, because, uh, you know, the uh, the objects of the seeking may be different, yeah. or the, uh, you know, what you're going for might be different, but the mechanism that is allowing the seeking is, th- is the same amongst all the uh, various... Yeah. Uh, directions or whatever. So I think I was a seeker in the sense that I was, I think I was always curious, but I was very suspicious, maybe. Mm -hmm. And I was a seeker of truth, but not necessarily spiritual truth. Yeah. So I think um, I enjoyed uh, playing those kind of mental games, Mm -hmm. you know, of. like thought experiments? Yeah, 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 that sort of thing. But yeah. I never thought of it as a spiritual thing. But I think the seeking is probably there for almost everyone. Yeah, there's somebody, I forget the guy's name, but uh, I read a quote recently where, in which he, he said it in a little bit more detail, but the essence of it was, you know, we're all on a spiritual path, all seven billion of us. And, uh, you know, I think you just said it, basically, that the regardless of what one is seeking, the fundamental force or motivation which causes one to seek uh, is, a, in, in the deepest sense, the same thing. And one thing leads to the next. I mean, a person's whole motivation might be to seek money. And at a certain point, they might feel like, okay, well, I've got money, or I don't have money, but nonetheless, that, that doesn't seem to be doing it for me. So now what? What more can I mm-hmm. find? Uh, you know, maybe a relationship and or something, and then at a certain point, well, what more is there? There's always this sort of tendency to move in the direction of, of something more, and uh, you know, and there's some people who say that, you know, seeking is a trap, and you're not going to find freedom until you drop it. Uh, but I think they might be putting the cart before the horse in that, when you find freedom, you do drop it. You know, uh, but it's not necessarily natural to drop it before you have found it. You know, yeah, those sort of sayings. I, it's hard for me to understand sometimes. Like you have to do it this way because you're just fooling yourself, or it's all an illusion. It's all this. It's all that. Blah blah blah. It gets tiring after. A while. Yeah, in, in some circles these days, especially neo advaita circles, it's very uncool to be a seeker. Uh, you know, mm. it, it's considered to be a something that just keeps you on the mouse wheel relentlessly you know running around in circles uh but you know as as christ put it seek and ye shall find there there's definitely um 
it's a natural thing I think that people do and I th in my own opinion and this is always subject to revision it's it, you know it, it can be you know misguided misleading to advocate that it be dropped prematurely if a person is naturally inclined to seek let them seek and uh, you know if they reach a certain level of experience or realization maybe that that intense craving will just dissipate of its uh, naturally and uh, you know, I mean, in a way, you could say, let's let's take your ex your experience for, uh, for an example. I mean, you, I, w I wouldn't say you f you have any sort of intense craving or sense of seeking anymore, but you do engage. I mean, you have an interest in what we're, what we're talking about here. Otherwise, you wouldn't be talking to me. And yes. you you write stuff all the time, and you talk to people all the time. So even though that might not be out of a sense of lack or emptiness or yearning, it's there's some gratification from it. There's some kind of uh, force which leads you to do those sorts of things as opposed to watching soap operas all day. <laughs> well, I've thought about that. That's very interesting because uh, when you have those sort of feelings, um, when you're getting something out of the interaction or you're feeling maybe you can't quite express it, you you just want to keep doing it. You know, you kind yeah. of feel right in doing it. You enjoy it. Uh, I'm not sure that. Um, the desire is needed mm -hmm. in that sense it's not necessary for me to desire to want to talk to people i'll just i'll talk to them you know what i mean yeah well, and, i think I a mean, desire I can be subtle a desire doesn't have to be yeah. sort, of, sort of a craving that's gnawing away at you it's just uh, mm -hmm. an, an impetus you know you you're inclined to turn on the computer and write something and talk, call somebody up and talk to them i mean those are based on desires but it's i mean you know if you get hungry you have a desire to eat and you go to the kitchen. So uh, desire doesn't necessarily mean something that is burning up inside you or, or trapping you in some kind of sense of lack. It's just not the um, Napoleon Hill esque kind <laughs> of desire. Right. It's just uh, that which <laughs> causes us to lift our hand or go to the bathroom or whatever. There's always these little imp you know, these little impulses to do this, do that, do this, do that. And in, in your case, it sounds like it's become a fairly, um, you know, major occupation or pre preoccupation to write and speak and think and talk about this kind of thing. Well, I think, uh, I hope I can get it right this time. It's just sitting in a room mm -hmm. by myself. There's, uh, if I'm just literally just sitting in a room. Mm -hmm. Everything seems really flat hmm. or colorless, even though literally that's not true. Uh, seems very colorless. Seems very uh, bland. I don't. I was know just going to say bland. Yeah, good. Mm. Same same word. I was going to say. But uh, I think the essence, one of the essences of being human, is that relationship with other human beings. And something is different when someone else is there. Yeah. There is some kind of richness that's added to everything. Mm -hmm. You know, life is no longer flat, and things seem more colorful. There is, you, you tend to be more awake in that sense. Yeah. Awake, I mean, literally awake, not like you're kind of drifting off and dozing. And I don't understand why people can't see the richness in relationship just speaking with someone, mm -hmm. you know, just being with another person or being married. You know, it's so much more fun yeah. to be married, I think, than to be single. I mean, I've, I was single for a long time. And I've mm -hmm. been married since 2006. Mm -hmm. It's so much more fun yeah. to be with someone, to laugh and to, you know, just do all the things that you normally would do to have that person to share all those things with. So mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, if desire is the right word, it may be out of a need for that uh, vibrance to continue. Mm. Or, um, you know, I'm not sitting here thinking like, oh, man, this sucks. I've really got to talk to some people to get myself out of this funk or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like that. But uh, there is some richness that's added when you bring other human beings into the mix, into yeah. your life. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So, I mean, yeah, even, so while, even monks while it's in monasteries, the, you know, they have other monks that they sort of interact with. And, and solitary confinement is considered one of the worst forms of punishment, you know. Mm-hmm. But that uh, brings up a question, uh, well, at least in my mind it did, on the importance of silence. Mm -hmm. 
because I think many people have written about silence or the importance of silence or the importance, the importance of being alone. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily lonely, but alone. And I wonder if I can ask you a question. Sure. sure. Um, what do you think of the importance of... Uh, being alone, being silent, being kind of not necessarily isolated, but spending that kind of alone time uh, with yourself to kind of learn more about. Do you think that sort of thing is essential for spiritual seekers? I think it depends on the person. I mean, I, I meditate for an hour twice a day, and so that's a form of silence. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, some people go into extended periods of silence. I mean, I in the old days, I used to go on courses for six months at a time and do a lot of meditation. And, uh, you know, it sort of gets you away from the r regular impact of, of the world on, on your senses and so on and enables you to sort of go deeper and establish something deeper, which um, then, you know, when you return to activity, tends to be retained to a great extent. And... Mm -hmm. um, so I think there, you know, there, there's silence in the way you described it in, in terms of an actual situation where you're, you're being silent and you're in silence in terms of other external stimuli. But there's also a, a silence, which I'm sure you can relate to, which is with you regardless of the external circumstances. I mean, you know, if you're walking down the street in Tokyo, I'm sure it's very noisy and busy and there's a lot of <laughs> stuff going on. But uh, don't you have a sense of, of s inner silence, if you want to call it that, which, which you just sort of reside in, regardless of all the hubbub? Well, it's very strange because uh, there are, there, sometimes there's a surging of certain physical uh, feelings. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, I find it over the, the last few years, uh, I don't know if my hearing is getting bad, but there are certain times when I have to completely focus on the person's face, otherwise I will not hear anything they say. Huh. And it's not necessarily because there's a lot going on. I mean, it usually happens, you know, if a train is going by, if there's some sort of swelling of uh, uh, sound or vibration, but it's so amplified in my head, I don't know why that is. Hmm. So, um, Akiko, my wife, she knows all about this, so she knows when to stop talking to me. Because you're it's not amazing. <laughs> well, because I can't hear. I could be looking directly at her, uh -huh. and I have to follow, like lip read, to hear her sometimes. Huh. And I don't know so why. So where is your attention? What are you? What, where is your hearing? What it, What are you focusing on that you can't hear her? I. It seems. I don't know if this is true. It seems that I can't filter out the sound. That's well, the you way mean it other appears. Other sounds. You mean like the hum of the refrigerator and the traffic noise outside and whatnot. It, you can't sort of discriminate it's, between those and and your wife talking so as to listen to her. It's one sound. Oh, what's the one sound? Everything. Oh, so you mean the conglomeration of all the other sounds in the environment? Now, what mm -hmm. if you were in a in a padded room, soundproof room? and someone was talking to you, would that ever be a problem? Or, or in, in a situation like that where there's nothing else going on but the one person you're talking to, would that, could that not happen? I've not, I've not found that. That's interesting. That mean, makes me want to experiment. It's a hypothetical situation now. which you just haven't <laughs> tried, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Well, I don't, but know. I don't, I don't know, know what to say about I that. I don't know why that is. It's hard because my vision hasn't been affected in no. that sense. Although um, there has been some difficulty in seeing... It's it's very strange. Vision is very strange. I mean, I have twenty twenty vision, and it, you know, I don't have any physical problems with my eyes, but uh, it's almost like you're seeing you're not seeing various things. You're seeing one thing, mm -hmm. in a sense. Yeah. And for the hearing, you're not hearing individual sounds. You are hearing sound. I see. And for some reason, it hasn't really happened. I've never gone blind. I mean, I, I don't even know how that would manifest itself physically. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, it's difficult to uh, hear. The yeah. physical sensation is strange. And it is physical because it's actual sound. It's not mm. like um, the sound of thought or something which has no real substance. It's, no, you know, it's not a vibratory in the same sense as you know, hitting something yeah. has a vibration that you can hear. Um, but it's always a physical sound, and it becomes overwhelming to the point where if someone, it's, it's odd, someone is speaking to me, 
it's like every sound is coming out of their mouth, every sound that is around me. Huh. And I don't know why that is. And this could be part of the progression other people have told me about, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't know about this. It could I don't be. Know about I, I don't feel qualified to say. Um, there's a... Uh, you might want to watch the first interview I ever did. It's, uh, it's with the Fosters, and you'll find it on batgap.com. But um, Mary Foster talked about how when she had her initial awakening, uh, she, was, she couldn't see or hear anything. She just kind of went into this white light or whatever. She was standing on, on the porch of her house, and, uh, and she went for like days without being able to speak or eat or <laughs> do anything. And uh, it's, it's not exactly what you're describing, but it's, it's sort of like she went through this state which you wouldn't really want to stay in because you couldn't function in, that, in a state like that. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I suspect that in your case it's not some kind of medical abnormality, uh, that it's, it's a stage that you're going through. And this gets back to my original point about, pro about progress. There's st transitions and stages and all kinds of things that you may end up going through that, you know, you have no idea. But um, I would suggest that it's something that you'll just evolve through and, and, you know, it won't be something that plagues you all your life. That's just my guess. Um, mm. you know, it, but, he, you know, even so, I, I don't have... Uh, there, there's physical difficulties, you know, because I can't hear what someone is saying, but um, I have no uh, feeling or desire to get away from it. It's almost like a cacophonous wave of, of uh, everything you could possibly hear all at the same time. It's not deafening you know yeah. the decibel level isn't particularly high you know if you're s sitting outside even if a truck goes by huh. you know you're not you're not in danger of you know damaging your ears or whatever but there's something about that collection becoming one yeah now there's another thought that comes to mind this this is kind of interesting uh, and I'm I'm just playing armchair guru here cuz I don't really know <laughs> you know but uh, you know obviously as human beings we we have uh, Filters which enable us to make sense of the world, because if we were bombarded with all of this, all of the information that's out there at any given time, we wouldn't be able to function. It would just be overwhelming. So we mm -hmm. we we necessarily have to filter most of it out and focus on one thing or the other thing. Um, but in, in thinking of like various saints and gurus that uh, I've read about or have known, they they do have a tendency to be able to sort of tune into a lot of stuff at the same time and comment on things that you wouldn't have thought they would have known was going on. You know, what somebody in the back of the room was thinking, for instance, while they were in the middle of talking to somebody else or giving a lecture or something. And, you know, they'll come out with something which in great detail that indicates that they knew exactly what this guy was thinking or what he was doing, you know, 10 miles away before he got there. So obviously it's possible to be tuned into a much broader range of uh, detailed experience than we ordinarily are. And maybe, I'm just guessing, maybe you're having just some kind of taste to, of that and you haven't integrated it yet. You know, you, it's at a stage where you're just beginning to get glimpses of it and it becomes a sort of handicap because you haven't learned how to function with it. Uh, and, uh, you know, as time goes on, you'll You'll, you'll learn how to function with it better, or maybe it'll go away again entirely. I don't know. But, um, you know, it could, it could very well be that something good is happening, and it's, it's just a matter of time and maturation of the experience for it to, uh, you know, for you to get past the uncomfortable stage and, and integrate it. Well, it hasn't killed me, so... No, and as Nietzsche said, it's whatever fine. doesn't kill me <laughs> makes me stronger, right? So <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, after you... Uh, you know, had this awakening. I mean, you'd already been with the woman you ended up marrying, or maybe you had married her, you said, a month or two beforehand. Uh, uh, it was uh, earlier that same year. Yeah. Um, did she notice the change in you? Uh, or other people close to you? Did they, whoa, what happened to you? you you're different. She's very... So open, in a sense, that it's hard for her to see the difference, I think. We have a joke that uh, if I don't shave for a few days, I can grow a mean beard. Uh -huh. Like I can get like a, a ZZ Top thing going really quickly, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And uh, I can let a beard grow out for a month, a month and a half, two months, and you know, I'm living with my wife every day. And one day I'll just shave it all off. Mm -hmm. 
she will not notice. Ah, interesting. She doesn't notice anything like that at all. Huh. And I, we've talked about this a lot, and as a joke, uh, I think it's true. I don't think it's a joke. She says that she only sees my true nature. Mm, that's cool. So whatever I look like physically, it doesn't matter. Hmm. So I think... Uh, Maybe I, I ought to get a wig and come home with long hair someday. <laughs> 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 See if she notices. <laughs> oh, the things I've thought of doing to try and be noticed. <laughs> but uh, I think that uh, I think she is that way. Hmm. So I think uh, well, that's nice. She has a, an uncanny ability to see. I think. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is not much that she is ever confused about. Hmm. She has this vicious sort of clarity if that's the right way to put huh. it so she can i think she can see very uh, clearly without without too much imagery on yeah. her part yeah. so uh <clears throat> if i you know if one day i look like billy gibbons mm -hmm. and then well, the next day billy I gibbons by the way is a tm teacher you know uh, is he really yeah he was an old-time meditator and he went to courses and became a teacher he probably doesn't even meditate anymore but he did that back in the 70s I had no Just idea. An interesting little <laughs> sidelight. So if yes, by, so if one day you looked like Billy Gibbons, that you were, you were saying. <laughs> yes. And then and then I shaved it off. She wouldn't really notice. Yeah. And then you know we have like a special celebratory dinner if she does happen to notice because it's such a rare event oh, cool. for her to notice something different than yeah. you know me. You know. So I think uh, when all of this went on, I think she was that same sort of person. Uh -huh. I think. Um, there may have been some things that she has gotten used to over the years. Um, like recently in the last year, I've had difficulty hearing sometimes, and she's yeah. kind of accustomed to that. That thing you were talking but, about. Yep. Yeah. Billy but Gibbons, other, by the way, for the benefit of our listeners, was uh, is one of the guitar players for ZZ Top. That's why he mentioned him, because he mentioned ZZ Top earlier. Yeah. Um, does your wife? Did your wife have any sort of uh, spiritual awakening herself, or an interest in that sort of thing, or is she just sort of naturally endowed with clarity and ability to see people's essence? Well, she's been working for a religious organization in Japan since uh, she was nineteen or twenty. Mm -hmm. Nisha and Shoshu Buddhism, or something else? No, it's oh. called Seicho Noye, and it was founded, oh. I think, in the around the time of the Depression, mm. and. Um, I, I'm not qualified to talk on it, you know. Yeah. But uh, I think its uh, its philosophy is that all paths lead to the same source, mm -hmm. you know. So it's not exclusive in any sense, you know. It does not turn away people. It does not say, well, you have to be this sort of person, you know. It's very uh, open and complete for for anyone. Uh -huh. And um, she's been a part of that since. Well, I guess it's almost 20 years now. Mm. And she is a minister with uh, Seichinoye, and she works in their international department. Cool. <clears throat> so, yeah, she has a huge background in spiritual teachings of that particular religion, but also they also encourage reading other holy books. So, yeah. you know, she's familiar with a lot of other things, way yeah. more than I that's she can sure. she can do your reading for you and just kind of give you the essence of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So give me two sentences, honey. What right. are you saying? <laughs> give you the cliff notes. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, um, how are we doing? Is there anything else that uh, you know we we should be talking about that I haven't thought to ask you that you'd like to bring up? Well, I'm not much one for self promotion. That's all right. <laughs> so. Promote yourself. Go ahead. You have a website. We're going to link to that. And what will people find if they go there? Hmm. Possibly something interesting, or possibly disappointment. <laughs> but they'll be able two. they'll be able to read things you've written, and if they're really interested in, in doing so, they could you know have a Skype conversation with you or whatever. Yeah, and I've been doing that. Uh, I've been using Skype for that for the last uh, probably close to two years now. But yeah. it's been uh, audio only, only until recently. Well, now you have this nice new computer and nice camera and headphones and everything, so they can do it by video. And it works. Yeah, it looks great. I mean, this is one of the clearest uh, ones I've done. So, and you're in Japan, so it's cool. Do you have uh, do you charge for these conversations, or is it just no? And I'm glad you brought that up. Labor that's something of love. That's, that's something that would be so strange to me because um, 
Someone had asked me that before, mm -hmm. and I think we've had conversations on the side about this through the comments. Like, uh, do you charge for this, or you have an ebook? Do you charge for that? Yeah. It seems so strange that someone would charge for this kind of thing. It's nothing. <laughs> I mean, it's it's important to people. I'm not I'm not saying it's not, but right. it's it's nothing. I mean, right. why should I? Uh, it's like charging for breathing or using the restroom or something. Uh, I mean, it's. Yeah. It's something that uh, is so foreign to me. Now, I understand that people, you know, need to make money, and there are a lot of people uh, talking about this that promote themselves. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the neo advitists if that's, uh, did I pronounce that correctly? I think so. I think uh, I know the type of people you're talking about, and it's always very amusing to me that they, that some of them promote themselves heavily and then tell the students that, there's nothing to do and nothing to find. Right, and you don't need you know? a teacher. Yeah, so why do you need the, why do you need these to promote yourself? You know, yeah. it's just kind of funny huh. the thing that I thought. But, much, um, much ado about nothing, as Shakespeare said. <laughs> but uh, I do this a lot, and the only thing that it requires is just to send an email and let me know a time, and if I have time, we'll talk for an hour or something. And it's 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 nothing. It's free. You know, That's great. you know, Skype Skype is free. Yeah. You know, I don't don't use my home phone I don't you know this we should take advantage of the technology while we have the the chance you know yeah well I bet you that um, you know a lot of people who watch this will want to talk to you um, anyway I mean not all the people that I have interviewed have a setup like that where you can just call and talk to them but uh, you've obviously put yourself out there as willing to do that so um, we can say it now to anyone listening to this if you if you want to have a conversation with um, Takoin just um, Skype him, and uh, I guess if we go to your if you go to your website, you'll see your, your there's an email address and maybe a Skype address or whatever, so they know. How yeah, to on it. the um, the contact page, all that information yeah. is there. Good, good. Great. But I'd like to ask you a question though before we wrap all this sure. sort of thing up. Uh huh. Why did you decide to start doing this? What's the story? If you can briefly tell yeah. me. Yeah. Well, I have a, a long history of being interested in this sort of thing. I mean, I, I learned to meditate when I was 18, and now I'm 60, almost 61. And uh, so this is this sort of thing has been my primary focus most of my life. Um, and in recent, in, I, I worked for the TM movement for 25 years, teaching transcendental meditation and doing administrative tasks in that organization. And then for the last 15 years or so, or whatever, I haven't been doing that, just been, you know, <clears throat> living my life, and earning a living, and so on. But nonetheless, I'm, I continue to be fascinated with uh, this sort of thing, and uh, you know, reading things, listening to things, and I've also, I've also always had uh, kind of a, a des uh, kind of an interest in asking people questions and interviewing people. When I watch Larry King, I think, God, I'd love to do that. He's retiring. Why can't I have his job? You know, <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, so somehow or other, one night I was in the garage uh, working out on my Bowflex machine, listening to Adya Shanti, and uh, the idea just came. I, I'll do an interview show, you know, that'll be fun. And so initially I, I tried to talk my uh, local radio station here into letting me do it there, and I did a pilot and so on. And they kind of dragged their feet for a few months and, um, you know, finally said they didn't want to do it. So, so then I thought, all right, well, and friends were encouraging me to do it as video rather than just audio. So I went to the local public access TV station, and uh, they they were, you know, gung ho. They 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 were looking for programming produced by local people. So we started taping them, and uh, you know, then at one point they were taping against a green screen, which uh, is then supposed to be replaced in the software with some nicer looking image. And so if you look on the website now, you'll see a bunch of videos we put up with this hideous-looking green screen in the background because <laughs> they, they still haven't gotten their software hardware situation sorted out where they can replace the green screen. But I've just moved ahead anyway, and they still haven't aired any of the things on this public access station. So at a certain point, they said, we're not going to tape anymore until we solve our technical problems. Um, so I, I, I was wanting to get Skype going anyway and start interviewing people you know, around the world because there's so many interesting people to talk to outside of my little town. And uh, so I figured out how to do it and down and got some, the right software and so on, <clears throat> which, by the way, is called VODBurner. If anybody's interested in listening, listening to this and is interested in uh, taping uh, their own conversations, it's, it's great software, and the people who write it are really wonderful and cooperative and helpful, um, VODBURNER. -E 
And uh, so, you know, the rest is history, and uh, I've just been doing these every week. Well, it seems like uh, great fun. A great it is. opportunity to really meet uh, interesting people, because I've watched a number of the interviews now mm-hmm. since uh, I think we first emailed each other, what, in July sometime? Uh-huh. Yeah. And I've had the opportunity to... Uh, watch a few of them it's very interesting especially uh, you know i'm i'm a nut for words i love the words that people mm-hmm. use and and it's very interesting to me to see them express these things in ways that i would never think of doing you know it's just very it's fascinating to yeah. hear these people speak yeah. i agree and uh you know that's why i i listen to a lot of stuff in fact on the site there's a, there are links to some other things like this there's you know urban guru cafe and you know various uh, other shows where people interview others and talk to them about this kind of thing and I'm always listening to that that sort of thing while I'm cutting the grass or brushing my teeth or <laughs> you know mm-hmm. doing different jobs just because I uh I like to keep my attention on it and I find it fascinating to hear various ways of expressing things um for instance just the other day I heard an analogy which I thought was really cool uh which was, while well, I was listening to one of these shows, which was uh, meant to illustrate the, the difference between sudden awakening, uh, which we might say that you had, and gradual awakening. Um, and the, 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 the analogy used was that, you know, you could be out taking a walk and get caught in downpour and you're drenched. Uh, or you could go take a long walk in a heavy mist and by the end of it, you're drenched. You know, you're just, <laughs> you're just as wet. But in the case of the heavy mist, you can't really say when you got wet. You know, just somehow, I'm wet. I don't know when it happened, but look at me. Uh, so, like that, you know, some people have these sudden awakenings, and they can tell you, they can mark it on the calendar, tell you the exact time of day, um, and the exact, exact circumstances. Other people, you know, they, they feel, well, I'm awake, you know, there's, but I can't really tell you exactly when it happened. It just kind of snuck up on me. <clears throat> well, I think... Uh there's no way that we can ever say that this is the end, meaning um, a particular state that someone is in. You know, right. like uh, someone is awakened and they might think, "Oh, this is it, and I'm going to do yeah. this and that." I think maybe uh, in the beginning I had no way of seeing another way. You know, I had no way of knowing that it could have been a level of this or it could have been a level of that. And uh, I think that when we were talking about levels, I think it's absolutely. It, it could absolutely be true. Mm-hmm. You know, even if I can't see it, it doesn't mean that it doesn't take place. Yeah. You know? yeah. And I think uh, to think that this is the end, wherever you happen to be, uh, there is absolutely no way of knowing that. And right. you would do yourself a great disservice by assuming that you've hit, you know, you've hit your, your stride, you've hit your ceiling or whatever. Oh, yeah. And I think that, I don't know if, Continual growth is the right word because it's not necessarily a physical mm. process as far as I can see. Mm-hmm. But there needs to be that openness. You know, you keep walking, you keep moving, you yeah. keep getting older. There's no real end to mm-hmm. the way that you might progress. You yeah. know? So yeah. even if there is a top level, I don't know that that's the top level. You know? right. And if someone happens to be there, they're just going to keep going and keep going until the body says, you know what, we're done. <laughs> yeah, and then maybe they're just done with that body, but there might be another body in which they they continue progressing. There's yeah, and a, we don't even know that. No, you know? we don't. Uh, there's this book I've mentioned a number of times on these shows that I'm slowly reading my way through called uh, Halfway Up the Mountain, The Error of Premature Claims to Enlightenment by Mariana Kaplan. And uh, just last night I was reading a chapter in which she talks about enlightenment as the beginning. And she quotes all these teachers and, and you know Zen monks and various other you know, people who have attained enlightenment who say, that's kindergarten. You, you, you get enlightened, you're just starting out. Uh, you know, and from, you know, obviously that in one sense that's not true, but from their perspective, that was their experience and that they realized that there's so much more yet to explore, you know, once that, um, that awakening has taken place. So, I, you know, and I kind of like to think of it that way. I, I don't find that at all discouraging, as some people might. Some people are like, oh, my God, I've got to keep going. Uh, uh. But, I, you know, I think, oh, boy, you know, more, more fun in the candy store. Well, I, uh, this might be a, an assumption, but I think that as the years go by, um, there will be some 
kind of richness that's added to the whole thing. Yeah. You know, as you get older, as you meet more people, you travel to different countries, you, you know, do whatever it is that you do in your life. As the years go by, something is growing in that sense. Something is always kind of turning over and becoming new mm -hmm. and fresh again. Exactly. And, um, yeah, it's never, uh, I think maybe it's never right to say it's the end. No. You know? And I, I would suggest that perhaps um, you have already experienced the taste of that richness that, you know, in the last three, four years since your awakening, there, you know, what you just described is already happening to you and it will happen to a much greater extent as the years go by, but there's already some of that uh, developing. And, you know, and again, you know, there's, when there's not a contrast, I mean, you experienced the contrast when you had that experience with the car, night and day difference, but uh, a lot of growth takes place without any contrast. It's just sort of, you know, it sneaks up on you. It's subtle. And if you were somehow able, to, oh, <laughs> if you were somehow able, the cat just brought in a mouse or something, if you were somehow able to, you know, jump from where you were four years ago to where you are now, you, you might notice a contrast. You know, you might think, whoa, you know, that, that was quite, I have changed quite a bit. I have grown quite a bit. But, you know, it's like a child growing. You don't notice the change unless you put them up against the wall every now and then make a mark. You know, mm -hmm. it's just this subtle, subtle, you know, incremental growth. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can say at the end that uh, richness is the inevitability. Yes. You know, it's not necessarily even death, although, you know, all physical organisms come to an end eventually. Right. But that richness is inevitable. And um, to deny that, if someone is at the beginning of uh, an awakened journey, or however we might say it, to deny that there may be richness added in the future is to kind of cut yourself off from other possibilities. You know? Yeah, and how do they know that, there's, that that's not going to happen? I mean, there's one teacher whose name I won't mention, but I was listening to uh, a talk by him, and he was saying, you know, there is no God. That's just a, a concept that people create, you know, to entertain themselves. There is no reincarnation and, and all this stuff because, from his perspective, there is no self and the world is an illusion. So then, how could all these things have any reality to them? Uh, but how does he know that? You know, I mean, he's speaking from his perspective and, and everyone is entitled to their perspective. But to, to be fundamentalist about it, to be adamant, to me is not a m totally mature perspective. Um, you know, in fact, uh, again, another thing I've mentioned in several interviews, but um, I think it was Nisargadatta who said that uh, a nice measure of, of spiritual awakening is the degree to which you're comfortable with ambiguity and paradox. In other words, you don't try to glom on to some certainty and adamant, you know, perspective or belief and say this is the way it is and, and I won't take any you know objections to this um, you know it's, it's much better to there's a there's a, a great saint named Amachi or Ama whom you may know that I go to see a lot and she in almost every time she gives a lecture she, she always says we should always have the attitude of a of a beginner you know just always have this attitude that we well she doesn't elaborate on it too much but I think that's just what you're saying that we really don't know you know yeah, perhaps in the beginning, uh, after that had happened and I had been writing for a year, uh, I don't know that it, you know adding experience was necessary, although there were experiences, and I don't know that uh, adding more words would have been necessary, but uh, clearly there is something that, ha I don't know if it's evolution, richness is, it, that's the word I'm using. Yeah. There's a richness that is here that I'm not sure was present before. Before they, before your awakening, or before like you know three years ago after your awakening, even then that you didn't have the richness, and now you're beginning to have it. After I'd begun writing. Yeah, yeah. So richness is developing, in other words. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. that's just a word, but there's the, something. Um, the cake is getting iced. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. But there's just so many things to experience, so many things to learn, so many people to meet, so many animals to see yeah you know I mean it seems like every week if I you know I, I like uh, you know, Discovery Channel and those sort of things and it seems like I'm always watching some new documentary with an animal that I could never imagine had existed prior to this so it's just you know there's so many things that we can't uh, fathom you know, there, there is a, a, a massive magnitude of this richness that can be yeah. had so 
And some people might it's... say, in hearing you say that, well, you know, some people might say, well, what does that have to do with awakening? Because there are plenty of scientists who are inquisitive and who are fascinated and who devote their lives to exploring new things and, and all. Uh, but I think the, there, there's a subtle difference in which you're, maybe not so subtle, in which what you're saying is, you know, it's not that you're sort of um, kind of just investigating a particular niche of, of knowledge or something and, and exploring that, but that you've kind of gained a foundation which is f fundamental to all knowledge and all experience, and then on the basis of that foundation, you're finding fascination in the details of, ex of expressed creation. Uh, you could even say that this is sort of you know, there's one, uh, one thing, again, that, that Maharishi Mahesh Yogi used to say was that after self-realization, uh, what begins to grow is the ability to appreciate, the, uh, the, to appreciate creation. And that, you know, it grows to a degree that wouldn't, wouldn't have been possible bef before the self-realization, but that as it grows, you know, it, one grows in the direction of knowing God because as, as the appreciation gets more and more and more profound, uh, the desire to know the Creator begins to, des begins to dawn in you. In, in other words, you begin to appreciate the creation so much, the desire to know who created this. You know, I'd like to, I'd like to meet the artist who painted this beautiful painting. And mm -hmm. so that desire grows and grows and eventually is fulfilled. So that might be a an indication of what this richness you're referring to is uh, leading toward. Yeah, well, there's not a prescription for awakening, as you know. There's not, you know, a one-size-fits-all thing. There's not a particular set uh, formula that you can follow to get that thing. So um, the awakening is not dependent on knowledge or doings in that sense. No, I wasn't but, saying that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but the, uh, the awakening itself can be enriched by those things. Exactly. Yes. So one doesn't bring it about, but this can kind of, I don't know if the word grow is right, flowering, you know, mm -hmm. kind of like a flower opening. It's, uh, it can flower in its own way uh, based on the, the journey, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah. On the, not the path, but, you know, how one lives, how one moves, mm -hmm. how one goes through their life. You know, so these things shouldn't be denied. Even though people say, "Oh, it's all an illusion. It's all this and it's all that." If it's all, if it's all an illusion, why do these people argue so heartily that it's all an illusion? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't understand. Yeah, hmm. and uh, there are there are a great many teachers who have said that, um, you know, at a certain point, the world becomes your guru. In other words, everything has a lesson to teach you, and everything has an evolutionary value. And perhaps it, it's always that way, but at a certain point it becomes consciously so. Um, and, uh, you know, you just, again, I, you know, what you're saying reminds me of that, that you, you know, the fascination you find in dealing, in talking with people and watching the Discovery Channel and all that, it's, it's, uh, it's serving as, a, we could say, an evolutionary technique or a spiritual practice to enliven or unfold more and more facets of your awakening. Is that, I think is that's that, is true. that ring true? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's true. Good. But maybe two years ago, it was impossible to see those sort of things. So yeah, uh, I, I don't know why that is. I think that in itself is interesting. Well, you know, I think uh, one explanation of why it might be is that the 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 evolutionary force is irrepressible. You know, it, it's it's that which you know. Breathes life into us all. It's that which, which which moves the planets and stars, which gave rise to the universe in the first place, and which has found a certain degree of fulfillment in actually evolving a form complex enough to to reflect back and know itself through. Uh, but it doesn't stop there, you know, because it keeps on like the Energizer Bunny keeps on going, and uh, you know, and so there's going to inevitably be further unfoldment, uh, it will just, you know, might take surprising twists and turns, but there's, I, I think you're, you're, you're getting onto it with this richness word. There, mm. It's that same evolutionary force which brought about your initial awakening is bringing about further enlivenment, and who knows where it will lead as the years go by. Mm -hmm. I think that's true. Yes. Yeah. Good. 
Well, that might be a good stopping place. Not that there is any good stopping place, because this is a lot of fun. We could keep going all night, but... Yeah, and uh, I don't know if I'm able to make myself clear sometimes, and uh, I appreciate you having the patience to listen to uh, the ramblings on this side of the world. I think you're pretty clear, you know, and we become, and I'm rambling too, I mean, you know, I, I, I babble a lot of times and I listen to myself <laughs> afterwards, I think, oh God, can't you just condense that to about a quarter of what you just said? But, uh, you know, this is how you get better at it, you just do it. You know? Yeah, well, English is one of the best languages for rambling. <laughs> yeah. I think there's a, there's a great joy in that expression, you mm. know. I mean, you know, in any language, not only English, but right. uh, I appreciate the communication here, and I feel, I don't know, a few feet higher than I did when we first started. It feels energetic. This is the right, this is the right feeling. This is the way it feels to share, you know. Yeah, and I hope our listeners feel that, too. If they don't, they're probably disconnected by this time. <laughs> 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 Good. Well, thanks. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. And as I often say to guests, you know, maybe we'll do it again in a year or two and s see what has unfolded in, in the interim. Absolutely. I'm always uh, up for a good chat. Yeah. So uh, thank you. This has been Buddha at the Gas Pump, another episode, episode number 35, I think. I've been speaking with Takuin Minamoto from Tokyo, Japan, uh, originally from Boston. And uh, my name is Rick. Ori oh, originally from Indiana. And, oh, Indiana. Okay, then through Boston uh, via via Boston to Tokyo. And yes, uh, my name is Rick Archer. And next week, I think I will be interviewing the person I said I was going to be interviewing last week, who had a family emergency and uh, had to cancel. Um, <clears throat> a gentleman named Richard Shooping, who says that he recovered from AIDS as a result of a spiritual awakening that he had, and he's a musician and so on. So um, if all has worked itself out in Richard's life, he may be next week, otherwise it'll be somebody else. So thanks a lot, and we'll see you next time.